not too long ago, uh, I had it out with a feminist who had come into a male safe space uh, from a feminist blog uh, just to scoff at the idea of male disposability. Um, she, she went there and basically said that the entire concept was a myth, that men's lived experiences were completely wrong, and that they were just a bunch of whiners who were complaining over nothing. Uh, yeah. Anyhow, that got me thinking about the concept of male disposability and how that interacts with the feminist movement. Male disposability has been around since the dawn of time. <laughs> uh, and it's based on, on one uh, very, very straightforward dynamic. Uh, when it comes to the well-being of others, they come first, men come last. This is, this is just the way it, it has always been. Uh, seats in lifeboats, uh, <laughs> being rescued from burning buildings, uh, who gets to eat? Um, really, society places men dead last every time, and society expects men to place themselves dead last every time. Humans have always had a dynamic of women and children first, and that has not changed at all. Uh, the 93% workplace death gap it has to be evidence of this, uh, if only because there's n nobody with any kind of importance or power who's interested in changing it at all. In fact, I remember reading an article in a BC paper not long ago uh, that described the increasing proportion of female injuries on the job as a huge problem. And the insane thing was, the change reflected a decrease in male injuries rather than an increase in female ones men's injuries on the job had gone down because the economic downturn had put so many men out of work in the resource sector that there just weren't as many trees or pieces of heavy equipment falling on men as there had been before. And yet, this was framed as a huge problem for women that required immediate actions to solve. Um, it, it's just crazy. Uh, it's like if men aren't dying at work at 20 times the rate women are, we must be doing something wrong as a society. Back when we were still living in caves, that attitude was necessary for human survival. Nature's a really harsh mistress, especially when you think of all the animals that never ever get to die of old age. Uh, things were a lot different for humans through most of our history on this planet than we are now. Life was dangerous, human settlements were small, isolated from each other, and one big disaster that took out a lot of women pretty much meant the end of the entire shebang for that group of people. So really, the level of importance that a human settlement placed on the well-being of women and children uh, reflected almost always how successful that settlement was, and that can be expanded to encompass entire societies. I keep hearing from the feminist camp that femaleness has always really been undervalued by society and that maleness is preferred, uh, but I've always contended that it's the exact opposite. The feminine is intrinsically and individually valuable, uh, simply because females are the limiting factor in reproduction of any species. Uh, when it comes to producing babies, every woman counts, whereas biologically, one very happy man could probably do the work of hundreds in that regard. So the level of instinctive importance we humans place on the safety and provision of women and their children, it's one of the main reasons why we've been able to be so successful that we've come to really dominate this planet. And while I will concede that this drive to keep women safe from all harm has often resulted in extreme limits being placed on women's mo mobility, uh, their agency, their power of decision to direct their own lives, uh, all through history in many cultures, and in many cultures even today. Uh, I think it's telling that those cultures tend to be the most backward. When you consider the restrictions placed on women in places like Afghanistan, and then you consider that if we bombed them into the Stone Age, it would be progress, I think you can conclude that the most successful societies had a really, really good balance between allowing women freedom and the ability to choose and direct their own paths in life and the need to protect them and provide for them. However, uh, feminists will insist that this, uh, 
these kinds of restrictions being placed on women in those kinds of societies are the ultimate form of, of objectification. Uh, you lock up your possessions to make sure that they will never be lost or stolen or harmed. Uh, honestly, if I were a guy on a battlefield, I might appreciate being objectified in that way. I think if I was going to be an object, I'd rather be a sexual one or somebody's prized possession than an object that can simply be thrown in the trash or smashed into pieces in the service of somebody else's purpose. Feminists also have a very, a very simplistic idea that our willingness to absolve women of their crimes, uh, slap them on the wrist, uh, spare them punishment, um, it comes from a deep disrespect society has for women's personhood. Uh, not seeing them as full human beings, uh, capable of looking after themselves, that we see them as children who don't know any better. And yeah, well, there are parallels uh, there in our desire to protect both women and children from uh, not only their own poor decisions, but the full consequences of their shitty behavior. It's really not as simple as they try to make it out to be. I mean, seriously, even today, even today in 2011, uh, we fully expect that if it comes down to a, a man and a woman in a burning building and you can only save one, the expectation is that you choose the woman every single time. So honestly, whose humanity are we placing above whose here? We're not talking about going to work. We're not talking about getting an education. We're not talking about having the freedom to decide what you want to be in life. And we're not talking about getting to take Taekwondo. We're talking seats and lifeboats here. Uh, the person in the lifeboat is going to survive no matter how capable or incapable they are of managing their own life. And the person going down with the ship is going to die no matter how independent, self-sufficient, and awesome he is. That's the equation. One life more valuable than another. And the woman wins every time. So honestly, is there any argument anywhere that women's humanity has always been held in higher regard by society than men's? To be important to society, a woman merely has to be. A man has to do in order for his life to have any meaning to anyone other than himself. I think it was man-woman myth who said our society reduces men from human beings to human doings. And I really think that's an apt analogy. Uh, we measure a man's worthiness to wear the title of man, <laughs> and therefore the title of human, through how useful he is, uh, either to society or to women. And one of the most useful things a man can do, even now in the eyes of society, is to put women and children before himself. And while I think there's plenty of argument that this attitude is at least partly innate, the way most survival traits are, even collective ones, uh, if it starts in the chromosomes, we really do everything that we can as a society to reinforce this dynamic. Studies have shown that even though baby boys tend to cry and fuss more than baby girls, uh, parents are quicker to attend to or console a baby girl than they are a baby boy. Um, even just the level of acceptance of infant male circumcision in our culture when female genital mutilation was banned pretty much the first afternoon we all heard it existed. It really says a lot about the differing expectations we have for males and females. I mean, speaking as a mother, uh, the last thing I would have ever wanted uh, was to hear my child cry, especially when they're at an age when they're completely helpless, completely at the mercy of outside forces, and utterly dependent on the adults in their lives for every last thing. And yet, even knowing how painful that cut is, we expect baby boys, only days old, for fuck's sake, to just suck that up. And just think about what even these very first interactions and experiences, these differences in how we nurture our babies, depending on what gender they are, what this teaches them. Uh, what do we teach baby girls when we attend to their crying so quickly? Uh, we teach them to ask for help because their needs are important. Uh, we teach them to let us know when they're afraid or in pain because it's important for us to know when they're sick or in danger or hurt uh, so we can do something about it. We teach them that when they're sad or lonely uh, to summon comfort and comfort will be there. We teach them that they're important. Uh, their needs and well-being, both emotional and physical, are important just because. And what are we teaching baby boys when we need them to cry? 
we teach them there's not much point in seeking help because it will be grudgingly given, if at all. Uh, we teach them that they should become self-contained in their ability to deal with uh, emotions like fear, uh, helplessness, loneliness, sadness, pain, distress. We teach them stoicism. We teach them to suck it up. Uh, we teach them that their fear and their pain are things that are best ignored. We teach them that their emotional and physical well-being are just not as important as other things. I mean, given all of that, is it any wonder it's like pulling teeth to get a man to go to the doctor when he's sick? What we're teaching that baby boy is all the things a man needs to know and feel and believe about himself if he's going to stand in front of a cabin with a rifle while his wife and kids hide inside. We're preparing him for the day he has to fix a bayonet to a rifle and charge a hill under enemy fire. And we're preparing him to make a decision to resign himself to an icy fate while women and children escape in the lifeboats. We are really teaching him to internalize his own disposability. And baby girls, by attending to her crying so quickly, by letting her know she's inherently important to us, we're preparing her for the day she has to think of her own safety first, even if it means the man she loves is left standing alone with a rifle in front of a cabin. We're preparing her to take that seat in the lifeboat we're training her to not allow guilt or empathy or acknowledgement of a man's humanity or any sense that he might just maybe deserve it more to convince her to give her seat to him. Because for millennia, the human species absolutely depended on her feeling 100% entitled to that seat. And that brings me to feminism. You know, the patriarchy smashers, those righteous avengers of equality. Uh, dogged dismantlers of every single gender role. What exactly is feminism doing to dismantle this traditional role of the disposable male? Feminism's greatest victories have only reinforced in everyone that society still owes women provision, protection, help, and support just because they're women. In its collective dismissal and abandonment of male victims of domestic violence, it only reinforces in men that it's pointless for them to ask for help because men's needs are of no relevance and their fear and pain don't mean anything to anyone. Feminism teaches us to put women's needs at the forefront of every single issue, uh, political or social, whether that issue is domestic violence law, sexual assault law, institutional sexism, social safety net, education funding, homeless shelters, government funding for shovel-ready jobs that didn't stay shovel-ready once feminists got wind of them. Everywhere you look, everywhere you look, there are feminists pushing their way to the front of the line, demanding women's fair share of all of the goodies, the good stuff, the, the loot, the booty, the cookies. Even if women don't need it, even if women don't deserve it, and even if somebody else needs it and deserves it more. And they get it, because we give it to them. Feminism has done nothing but exploit this dynamic of the expectation on men to put everybody else before themselves, especially women. Women's safety and support, women's well-being, and women's emotional needs always come first. This is the most stunning piece of society-wide manipulative psychology I think I have ever come across. Feminism has been on the down low with old school chivalry right from the start, and they might seem like strange bedfellows for sure, but they're not, because both concepts are built on a firm foundation of women. We made our way as humans through a really harsh history, and we became the dominant force on this planet, and one of the reasons we were so successful is because we have consistently put women's basic needs first, the need for safety, support, and provision. It was in humanity's best interest for women to be essentially self-interested and for men to be essentially self-sacrificing. But we don't need that dynamic anymore. I mean, our species is in no danger of, ex of extinction. I mean, we're seven billion people clogging up the works here. What's the worst that could happen if we all just collectively decided that men were no more disposable than women and women were no more valuable than men? In fact, the greatest danger I see to us right now is that in our desperation to bend over and give women everything they want and everything that they say they need, we've unbalanced society to the point where 
we're just in danger of seriously toppling over. And really, the only difference I see between the traditional role and the new one for men with respect to disposability is that maleness, manhood, it used to be celebrated, it used to be admired, and it used to be rewarded because it was really fucking necessary and because the personal cost of it to individual men was so incredibly high. But now? Now we still expect men to put women first, and we still expect society to put women first, and we still expect men to not complain about coming in dead last every damn time. But men don't even get our admiration anymore. All they get in return is to hear about what assholes they are. Is it any wonder they're starting to get pissed off? Anyhow, that's not all I have to say about this subject. Uh, but it is all I have to say about it today, since my kid is about to walk in the door um, home from school. So I am going to sign off, and hopefully I will see you all again. Um, for now, I'm Girl Right Sweat. Ciao. Hi everyone, sorry it's been so long, but this one took me a while to bang out. Um, I was watching a fairly old episode of the Agenda of TV Ontario for Affairs, Affairs Program uh, a while back that posed the debate topic, The Meaning of Man. One of the panelists was Professor of Psychology Jordan Peterson of the University of Toronto. And he, he's been an essayist on the Agenda uh, in the past, and I'm going to link to both The Meaning of Man and Peterson's Agenda Insight presentation, Goodbye to Good Men, down in the low bar for you guys to look at if you are interested. Anyway, the discussion has been prompted by this observation by Peterson on a previous installment of the Agenda. See, the thing about being male is you have to voluntarily accept responsibility for a family. Now, if you're a female, you don't have to do that because as soon as you have a baby, you're basically forced into the position where you're going to take responsibility. But a male has to do that voluntarily. And the rewards for that, fundamentally, at, at least to me, for the new generation, seems to have vanished. There's very little privilege, there's very little payment, there's very little stability. And so I see a lot of young men wondering, what am I supposed to do and why is it that I would do what I'm supposed to do in the future? What, what's, the, what's the game? And I don't, I don't really see what the game is for many of them. Now, the whole thing was quite interesting to me considering this is mainstream media in Canada in 2011. One of the things that really struck me was the contributions of Peterson and co-panelists Mark Rignaris, Professor of Sociology at the U of T at Boston, and uh, John Antini, Senior Editor of Maclean's Magazine. They were quite grounded in empirical reality and evidence-based observations, while Globe and Mail relationships columnist like Micah Tobe seemed to be all about feelings and fairness and the land of should. Um, it was like the moment he opened his mouth, I knew he was a feminist, and that conviction was only confirmed when this obscenely paternalistic yet feminist -y suggestion dropped out of his mouth. Um, you know, if men lower some of their ambitions, I know that sounds ridiculous, but it actually makes it so that women can move up a bit, and then both can have this sort of flex time to trade off, you know, working, or, you know, when one needs to go back to school, that's fairness. And it, now, he was rebuffed by Peterson more gently than I would have done, but uh, at least Peterson's response was grounded solidly in the realm of what is possible. Simply not possible to make some professions woman-friendly enough to allow women who want children and want to balance their dedication to family life with their dedication to work to compete with men in those arenas. It's just not possible to convince high-ambition men who can and want to work 60 to 80 hours a week to not do that. In any meritocracy, those who are the most brilliant and the most dedicated to the goal will generally rise, and those who prioritize other things will not. Now, part of me wonders how the discussion might have gone down, especially given the participation of a feminist relationship columnist, 
uh, had the study demonstrating that when men do more housework and childcare, a couple has less sex, been published prior to the air date. Or maybe the one just recently that demonstrated that couples who share the housework are 50% more likely to divorce. Regardless of all of that, it seems clear to me that the way men are is largely determined by what women desire them to be, and that what women desire men to be often has very little to do with what feminists, or maybe even women in general, outwardly claim that they want. Anyway, that discussion got me thinking about feminist hierarchy and sex, especially this bit from the leaders. You know, you also have to ask yourself if men are going to marry high-status women. I mean, there's a good study that came out in Britain about three years ago showing that for every 15-point increase in IQ, a woman's chance of being married dropped by 30%. And that's because it's difficult, like, I'm not complaining about the women, but the thing is, it, uh, the more intelligent, the more attractive, and the more educated the woman is, the smaller the portion of the male population that she's willing to consider. Oh, I see. I, oh, I, thought, you no gonna, doubt about I that. thought you were going to say the other thing, which is that men are too intimidated well, by that. Well, that's, that's, that the, too. that's the parallel argument. Of yeah. course they're too intimidated. And why too. wouldn't they be? They're out-competed. Well, they, why wouldn't they be? Why, sh why should they be? Shouldn't they just be happy about the fact they've got somebody fantastic? Why should they be intimidated by being associated with somebody who's wonderful? Well, partly because male confidence has a lot to do with dominance, hierarchy, status. You've got to so get over that, don't you think? I don't think it's possible. Because it's biology. It's not just human biology. It's biology across a much wider spread of species than just humans. And that got me thinking about a blog post by philosopher Anne Althaus uh, that she posted quite a while ago, wherein she speculates that perhaps uh, men are more driven to achieve power because power is what gets them access to sex. And, and I was thinking about all of these things and how they might relate to this little snippet from Stanford's lecture series on human behavior and biology taught by Robert Sapolsky. Very interestingly, something we will hear more about next week or so is another region of the brain is involved in male sexual behavior, which is the amygdala. Hmm. That's kind of interesting. The amygdala, we've already heard about amygdala, fear, anxiety, all of that. But the amygdala also plays a very major role in aggression. And there's a little bit, a small domain of amygdaloid function in males that's involved in sexual behavior, involved in sexual motivation. Medial preoptic area is much more about sexual performance in males. Amygdala is much more about se sexual motivation. And all sorts of people have speculated fairly reasonably, I think, that this may have something to do with the fact explaining why among humans it is far more likely to be males than females who go about confusing sexuality with aggression. That it's got something to do with this weird role of the amygdala in male sexual motivation, male sexual arousal. Because that last little snippet of information has been bouncing around in my brain for months trying to find a place to stick. I had originally considered, as Sapolsky implies, that male sexuality might be wired through the amygdala because men are required to engage in sexually proceptive behaviors. That is, it's men who approach women, men who express interest in a specific woman, men who must take on the greater burden of rejection risk, men who typically make the first move, men who propose marriage, all of that. In other words, to get sex, men have to be assertive in seeking it from women, and one could describe aggression as the extreme end of the assertiveness scale. Now, that's not to say that women don't engage in sex-seeking behaviors. Uh, you know, like, of course they do. In most of nature, the female's initial step in the dance, the step that actually almost always sets the entire thing in motion, uh, that's to signal through a variety of visual, auditory, olfactory, and ritualized cues her potential sexual receptivity. You know, if the giant swollen genitals and miasma of pheromones is what signals to male chimpanzees that a female is an estrus and willing to consider offers, human females engage in a range of more subtle visual displays and behavioral mannerisms to let the males in the vicinity know that they're unattached and interested in seeking potential partners. You know, one of the most interesting things I've read is that you can predict where a woman is in her reproductive cycle by how overtly sexually she will present herself in her style of dress. The closer she is to ovulation, the higher the hemlines and the lower the necklines, if you get my drift. Now, 
What's beautiful about this female form of initiation is that it expresses itself passively, non-specifically, and sometimes quite subtly, leaving plenty of room for plausible deniability. This gives a woman leeway to convince others, and perhaps even herself, that even if she's dressed in such a way as to make herself very sexually attractive to men, that doesn't mean she wants men, or perhaps you specifically, to look at or approach her. The um, woman's most common strategy is, as I said before, like putting out a broadcast, hoping the most attractive males will aim the laser pointers of their sexual proceptivity in her direction. And you see this all the time in nature. Females who passively seek sex by essentially putting out bait. You know, she puts out a scent indicating she's an estrus and then just goes on about her business. The males actively seek sex by tracking and pursuing that female. She signals her receptivity. It's he who must approach. She indicates she's interested in sex and then the sex comes to her. This is just how it works for a lot of species. And this seems to be the most common way things go down among humans too. Even in cases where a woman signals her receptivity to a specific man with glances, body language, and smiles, it's generally the man who approaches and makes his interest and intentions clear. You know, and the woman's non-committal form of initiation provides her plenty of opportunity to demure, or to insist she wasn't actually interested in the first place if she changes her mind. It also protects a woman from the potential decrease in her social status and perceived mate value that often accompanies an active, targeted sexual rejection. I mean, consider it. There's a big difference, both emotionally and socially, between a woman, say, going to a club and not having any men hit on her, which is still a rejection when you think about it, and her making overt advances only to have those advances rebuffed by a man she has clearly indicated she desires. In the first instance, she can at least save face by saying there were no men there she fancied anyway, while in the second, she's exposed to the decrease in her status, self-esteem, and the esteem of others that comes with being found lacking by a specifically desired potential mate. Social proof is a two-way street, after all, and in the case of sex, and making some moves, uh, it's potentially much more disastrous for women than it is for men. Perceived mate value for both men and women is measured in terms of general desirability among a peer cohort. And an overt, overt rejection is much more damaging to a woman's mate value than to a man's. In strictly biological terms, a woman who rejects a man is saying, I'm not willing to invest nine months of gestation, up to four years of lactation and heavy nurturing, and risk my life in return for 20 minutes of your time and a teaspoon of your genetic material that constantly regenerates, which is suspended in about 30 calories worth of cheap carbohydrates. A man who rejects a woman is saying, I'm not willing to take 20 minutes out of my life to hand you a teaspoon of my genetic material that constantly regenerates and is suspended in about 20 calories or 30 calories of the most cheaply, mostly cheap carbohydrates in exchange for you investing over four years and risking your life. You know, to exaggerate for effect, the woman is, in the strictest of biological terms, saying, I'm not paying you 50 grand for your chocolate bar, while the man is saying, I'm not willing to give you 50 cents for that Lexus. So when, when you kind of put it in those terms, is it any wonder that women seem to have a much bigger problem coping with direct and unequivocal sexual rejection, even though it happens very infrequently to them, than men do? Anyway, I was perfectly willing to consider that it was because males, not just human ones, usually have to make the first move, essentially that males must be sexually assertive with females if they're actually going to get any sex, that this could be why men's sexuality needed to be assumed wired through the part of the brain strongly associated with aggression and do-or-die instincts. Women, in contrast, did not evolve this way because, at least in the initial stages of courtship, sexually proceptive behavior of women is one, unnecessary, and two, accompanied by a risk of rejection and the subsequent huge decrease in a woman's perceived mate value among her peer group. In other words, it would harm her more than it would help her. Now, the reasoning goes that males wired this way would have been more successful than males who were not, while females wired this way would have been potentially less successful than those who were not. And we know this has to be the case, at least in terms of A and Z, if not the letters in between, because this is how men and women are wired. And Sapolsky's speculation implied that this difference in wiring is a means of providing males an additional boost to the motivators required specifically to engage in sexually proceptive behaviors toward women. This requirement to engage in sexual proceptivity could be why, as Sapolsky suggested, men are more likely to confuse sex and aggression. Except they aren't. 
Because when we actually look objectively at sexual aggression, which could be described as the most extreme form of sexually proceptive behavior out there, we find that women are about as prone to this type of behavior as men are, if not more. Heck, in heterosexual relationships, women are actually more likely to engage in the most extreme forms of force or threats to get sex from an unwilling partner. Numerous other surveys show that women are as likely as men to self-report having engaged in or having tried to engage in rape behaviors, perhaps even more likely. In fact, while feminists toss around the scary statistic that 1 in 12 men admit to raping or being willing to rape, a number of similar studies asking women the same question come up with numbers like 1 in 8 or even 1 in 3. What seems to be the case is that sexual coercion is a, an as common and more socially normalized behavior in women. The victimization rates of men and women are similar, but in some self-report studies, more women report having engaged in such behaviors in the past, sometimes percentages as high as over 40%, while a typically smaller percentage of men tend to report having repeatedly engaged in such behaviors. This would lead me to speculate that a larger percentage of normal women than normal men engage in sexual aggression against unwilling partners, which would lead me to further speculate that sexual aggression may be more likely to be a, a pathology in men and uh, would be considered much more typical in women. Now, it seems to be more the case that we view women as sexually passive and harmless and men as sexually predatory, and that this perception, perception informs all of our responses to sexual aggression in the real world. It seems to be very much about the ingrained narrative of courtship that feels most natural to us as humans, female researchers and female programs, as well as value judgments on the level of harm done. I mean, we make a big deal about it when someone carjacks Alexis, but not so much when they steal a chocolate bar. I mean, think for a moment about how differently we perceive someone, for instance, suggestively grabbing their genitals while making eye contact, depending on whether they're a man or a woman. With a woman, we consider her hypersexually receptive, and with a man, the exact same gesture is interpreted as hypersexually proceptive. She's signaling willingness or availability. Come get me, I'm ready for you. While he's signaling intent, I'm coming to get you. Her performance of the exact same action will not be perceived as sexual aggression, but his may very well be interpreted as exactly that. Similarly, if a random woman intentionally exposed her genitals, people would be amused by it or feel pity for her or think she was a loon or even be repulsed, while a man doing the exact same thing is much more likely to be viewed as aggressive and a threat. And while many of the studies on female sexual aggression imply in their discussion sections that this may be a new phenomenon in women, that feminism and the sexual revolution have emboldened women to behave aggressively when seeking sex, I have a hard time seeing female sexual aggression something so biologically driven as some new fashion that's only just come in vain. In Genesis, chapter 19, verses 32 to 36, a man's daughter, Lot's daughters, ply him with wine so they can have sex with him and get pregnant by him. I can't imagine the Bible or any of the people of that day considered that to be rape, but that's what it was. And while I do believe the Bible is a work of fiction. I can't imagine a situation like this would have even entered the minds of its authors if it was never known to happen in real life, that women were never known to fly a man with alcohol so she can have her, her way with him. You know, what I'm getting at is the very same behavior is more likely to be, be interpreted as receptive if it's displayed by a woman, they're more passive and not threatening and certainly not harmful and proceptive if it's displayed by a man, therefore active and more likely to connote intent, aggression, and ill will. You know, I'm thinking we're programmed, either socially or biologically or both, to view male sexuality as inherently active and aggressive, and female sexuality as inherently passive and non-aggressive. Which kind of makes me wonder how much more objectively sexually aggressive a woman would have to behave than a man to have people see that sexual aggression for what it is. So, what I'm looking at Sapolsky's suggestion that men are more likely to confuse sex and aggression, and I'm thinking things aren't as simple as he would like to believe, or most of us would like to believe. Um, we think men are more likely to engage in sexual aggression, but that's simply not the case. More than that, you have to also consider some fairly recent research into the sexual fantasies of men and women, which indicate that men prefer submissive fantasies to dominant ones. 
In other words, in a fantasy where one person is the ravisher and the other person is the ravishee, men would rather, at least in their inner sexual landscape, be the latter than the former. In fact, even though women preferred submissive fantasies to dominant ones as well, men rated these particular types of fantasies higher on a number of scales than women did. To be fair, men tend to rate all types of fantasies higher on a number of scales than women did, but that's a video for another day. So, here we see that in defiance of common wisdom, in the privacy of their own thoughts, the place where men are the least trammeled by what women in society expect of them, men are more likely to confuse submission than aggression with sex. You know, and you also have to consider the direct link between a female's physical safety and well-being as she makes reproductive success. To try to illustrate this is very simply for the sake of doubters, let's consider the case of the praying mantis. In captivity, females have been observed to kill and eat males during the act of mating, but the reverse has never, to my knowledge, ever been observed. Uh, and while such inconsiderate behavior on the part of female mantises may be much more rare in the wild and usually precipitated by the fact that the female is very, very hungry, it exists there as well, but not the reverse. So let's look at the scenario dispass dispassionately, concentrating on natural selection and a results-based paradigm. Females have evolved an instinct to kill and eat males during mating if necessary, that is, if they are in danger of starvation. Males have not only not evolved a tendency to do the same to females, they've not even evolved any mechanism towards self-defense when a female decides to make a meal of them. In fact, they have apparently evolved some mechanism to subvert their normal survival instincts specifically during mating in favor of prioritizing the nutritional requirements of their mate. Why would this be? Well, if a female is very, very hungry and a male is already inseminating her, it's actually in his best genetic interest to sacrifice himself, to allow her to have him for lunch. As long as his sperm are fertilizing her eggs and he serves himself up in this way, he's a winner. The propagation of his genes is only assisted by him letting the female have her wicked cannibalistic way with him, isn't it? That's a hundred or two hundred babies that are better off than they were before he provided their mother a much needed dinner. Every calorie of his body she consumes is a calorie devoted to the increased viability of his offspring. A male praying mantis would not have evolved an instinct to protect himself from this female behavior, even if it was common. At the same time, a female and her offspring would only benefit from turning a typical praying mantis male into an investment-oriented father by eating him if she was hungry enough, and she'd have evolved a mechanism that would allow her to do just that if need be. For praying mantises, natural selection would pass down the willingness to cannibalize during mating for females and the willingness to be cannibalized during mating for males, simply because those behaviors led to greater reproductive success for both males and females. And humans may not be praying mantises, but a woman's physical safety and well-being are integral to her mate's reproductive success because she is the one who gestates the fetus, while a man's physical safety and well-being are simply not as directly important to his mate's reproductive success. This is going to be the case whether the mating that is occurring is consensual or not, in either direction. Which might be one of the reasons uh, RAIN, the Rape and Incest National Network, uh, as, as feminist a website as you can find, recommends women both verbally and physically resist rapists, since in the vast majority of cases, verbal and physical resistance will prevent an attempted rape from becoming a completed one. Given the strength differential between men and women, and how violent men are known to be, uh, it is conceivable that when faced with serious physical resistance, a rapist will abandon the attempt not to avoid injury to himself, but uh, to prevent the level of catastrophic injury that might be necessary to subdue his victim. It might also go a long way toward explaining why virtually every man I've ever spoken to who has been raped by a woman did not physically resist her. Every single one I've spoken to who did not resist expressed a reluctance to do so out of concern over serious injury to the woman raping him. It might also interest feminists to know that the majority of convicted male rapist, rapists who acted out of displaced anger, you know, the ones who are the most likely to commit sexual homicides or to inflict severe injury and cruelty on their victims, were abused physically or sexually by a woman during their childhood. There is an argument to be made that male misogynists and rapists are made, not born, and that they're often made by women. 
women like Lot's daughters from that chapter in Genesis, who often justify their rapes of men and girls by telling themselves they're doing a giant favor. And why wouldn't they tell themselves that? They're giving him a ride in the Lexus, and only shaking him down for a chocolate bar. Statistics tell us that the majority of all aggression, whether male or female perpetrated, is perpetrated on men. And that the most violent and needlessly cruel and socially normalized forms of aggression, whether male or female perpetrated, are perpetrated on men. Year by year in the U.S., male victims of prison rape outnumber, by far, female victims on the outside. Male prisoners are at least 40% more likely than female ones to suffer sexual assault by other inmates or prison staff, and female prison staff are as likely or more likely to perpetrate sexual assault on both male and female prisoners in adult and juvenile facilities. None of this indicates that men have a greater problem with confusing sex and aggression. It indicates a societal problem with seeing and addressing female sexual aggression for what it is. Now, if the different wiring of male sexuality had the effect of facilitating sexually perceptive behaviors in men, we would, one would think, see major sex differences in rates of employing the most extreme form of sexual proceptivity of all, sexual aggression. But we don't. Which is why that little soundbite of Sapolsky's stuck in my head, and why it produced quite a bit of an obsession over the question. If it doesn't do that, then what the fuck does it do? And when I watched that installment of the agenda, and uh, remembered Anne Althaus's blog post, it sent me off in a completely different direction to see if I couldn't come up with a hypothesis. And I want to state right here that that's what's about to follow, a hypothesis. A conjecture that fits the facts, but is still just a conjecture. And I will leave it to the more scientifically minded to uh, find out if there's anything to it. I ended up looking backwards to where we were six million years ago because this looping of male sexuality through the amygdala didn't happen recently and it doesn't seem to be unique to humans. It's been this way for a long time for a lot of species. And where we were six million years ago was a sexually dimorphic tournament species whose social organization is probably fairly analogous to that of modern chimpanzees. And here's the thing. Most, perhaps all, arguably, of our hardwired emotions, all those instincts, anything we're programmed to think or feel to be all about, pretty much all of that is about sex and reproducing. It's either about getting sex and reproducing, optimizing sex and reproducing, living long enough to have sex and reproduce, or facilitating our kin's ability to have and or optimize sex and reproduce. Even our fight or flight instincts ultimately serve this purpose and can be systematically overridden if they get in the way of reproductive success as those male praying mantises and their evolved tolerance of being eaten by their mates aptly demonstrate. We're conditioned to believe that there are all kinds of other things motiv motivating us to a greater degree, ethics, morality, culture, goodwill, even mere survival. But consider for a moment that hunger is a survival mechanism that keeps people alive long after they're any use to anyone, but it wouldn't exist as an instinct hardwired into us if it had had no positive impact on who got to pass on copies of genes and who didn't. Hunger, thirst, fight or flight, fear, aggression, ambition, competition. In sexually reproductive species, every single one of these emotions, instincts, and behavioral propensities exist because they helped someone pass on their genes. They are, in essence, the products of who had sex and who did not. It's only when I extrapolated the importance of sex and reproductive onto all aspects of human behavior that I could see what was right in front of my face. Male sexuality is wired through the amygdala, not because men are or must be more sexually aggressive with women than, uh, than women are with men. It's because male-male aggression is what gets men access to sex. And no, this doesn't mean that all men are violent with other men, or that they have to duke it out and in the octagon to obtain access to sex with hot ring babes, you know, or that uh, all of a man's life is an epic rap, rap battle of history, nor does it mean that female dominance hierarchies don't exist. They absolutely do. But here's the thing. Female dominance hierarchies are not about access to sex. In sexually dimorphic species, harem species, like those proto-chimpanzee slash humans that used to be us, females always have access to sex. 
Consider the mountain gorilla, one of our closest relatives where virtually all the females reproduce, but only 5% of the males do. Consider chimps, where all the females reproduce, while less than 20% of the males do. Consider even the promiscuous bonobo, where about half to three quarters of the males reproduce, <coughs> even though they all have access to sex, um, because the most socially dominant males sire the majority due to females favoring them during estrus, while virtually all the females reproduce. Six million years ago among our ancestors, a lot further back than that, in fact, I'm almost positive, the primary factor determining whether a male would reproduce or not was his willingness to compete with other males in a male dominance hierarchy. And it probably wasn't much fun, even when battles were ritualized. Getting your ass kicked sucks and willingly and repeatedly subjecting yourself to potential ass kickings requires deprioritizing all kinds of other instincts and propensities. Fear, anxiety, injury avoidance, indolence, energy conservation, even survival. In other words, you need some serious motivation in order to assert yourself in the battle for male dominance that is the prerequisite for access to sexual opportunities for any tournament male. Now, for anyone who's doubting that male-male aggression is intimately tied to, to male sexuality, simply look at these images and ask yourselves why it is that for many, many species, this particular type of aggression increases during mating season. Even in social species like the baboons, where there are several males, with harems and without, living in cooperative groups, sharing the same territory, and so not having the kinds of territorial disputes that uh, a couple of male bears might have in the wild. Violent confrontations between males increase when females are in estrus. In those groups, competition between males and the obtaining of status within the male dominance hierarchy is sex-seeking behavior. Now, us humans have been veering away from the tournament model for about six million years and human males in the modern West no longer compete in any of those visceral, brutal ways because the modern environment has transformed the criteria for obtaining and maintaining status in the male dominance hierarchy. The more primitive forms of competition are now the ones that are considered ritualized violence, while the real game plays out in boardrooms, on legislative floors, in the media, the labor force, the military, education and academia, in schoolyards and the economy, the nightclub, the white ribbon campaign, and in thousands of subtle displays of male social relationship. We've actually come to see the real thing, physical aggression and potentially deadly violence, as a ritualization complete with rules, referees, and big shiny bells. And the more civilized and ritualized forms, social posturing, braggadocio, machismo, insisting on picking up the check, getting that covered contract, collecting letters after your name, use of the word Esquire, career success, holding forth, being in a band, getting that promotion, becoming president, being the go-to guy to score someone some weed, white knighting, bad mouthing, and a host of other ways men can say, I'm better than that guy, as something other than male male aggression. But aggression is exactly what it is. As Mr. 1001 Knights recently said, men are willing to believe another man is racist because it's a way of undermining that other man's status relative to one's own. And nothing undermines a guy's status uh, like being seen as a rapist. A rapist harms women, which is a cultural and biological taboo. And he's also a man who is so pathetic he can't convince a woman who willingly lie down. Now if, according to a man's instincts, to his lowest levels of wetwear, every woman on earth represents a potential means of getting his genes into the pool, then to all those same instincts, every unrelated or unaffiliated male on Earth is a potential rival or competitor in the quest for his own reproductive success. Someone he must one-up, aspire to equal, surpass, gain respect from, or throw under the bus if there is status to be gained by doing so. Now, if I'm correct in my speculation that it is the male sex drive that fuels male-male aggression within male dominance hierarchies rather than aggression fueling men's sex drives, then Jordan Peterson is right. Men do derive their confidence from dominance hierarchies, and this is something that isn't going to change anytime soon. Because it was so important to men's reproductive success over millions of years that natural selection wired it into their brains. This also leads me to consider a few possible consequences of this if it's the case. 
One, women may never perform equally to men at the upper reaches of those hierarchies because they lack the extra motivation men possess, possess that compels them to override all those other instincts and propensities that discourage an individual from wholesale participation in an arena that can be so demanding. Two, the phenomenon of what some MRAs call female colonization of male-dominated spheres will continue to precipitate an accelerating departure of men from those spheres. First, there is no masculine status to be gained by vigorously competing against women, only status to be lost. If you beat her, you're an asshole. If she beats you, you're a pathetic loser. Second, it fails to evoke the male compulsion to throw down and put everything into that, into competing against, you know, another male. So they simply lose their taste to compete in that sphere and wander away, the way they largely have from, say, teaching or veter veterinary medicine or psychology. Three, as Dr. Catherine Hakim theorizes, once a sphere becomes female-dominated, it loses status, not because it is female-dominated, but because those within it are less likely to treat the field as the primary measure of their so social status, according to Hakim. The British Medical Association recently expressed concern about this, saying that because women choose part-time work, etc., and do not put in the same time and effort into bargaining and trade union activities, so the relative pay and standing of doctors would decline slowly but surely. In Russia, where the majority of physicians are female, the pay and status of doctors is far lower than in the West. In other words, it's not the perception of women being lower status, but women's own reluctance to prioritize work above all else that leads those fields to become less prestigious and less well-paying. Women don't see their work as the most important thing, so when they come to dominate a field, other people see it the same way. And the most interesting thing is that competition on the female dominance hierarchy is largely a subconscious competition about overt sexual or mate value. Who can be the most beautiful, the most sexually attractive, the most able to afford to be selective when choosing partners? Women compete with each other sexually, but the goal, if evolution can be said to have one, is not to obtain sex. Remember, in a tournament system, females always have to obtain sex. The trappings of the competition are all about sex appeal, but the purpose of the competition is to gain status and power through the perception of high mate value. Men compete with each other within a power hierarchy, sometimes with violence, but the goal is not to obtain power or status. It's to obtain sexual opportunities through the attainment of status and power. Like Anne Althaus speculated, men seek power to gain access to sex, and women use sex to gain access to power. This does not mean that men who seek power, or who are high achievers, are consciously looking to get laid. Some noted male high achievers, such as Nikola Tesla, had little to no interest in sex at all. But that doesn't mean their sexual wiring didn't amplify their drive to achieve. One could even see those men as having taken the boxer's wisdom of abstaining from sex the night before the big fight to its extreme. As I've said before, evolution doesn't have a purpose or a goal. It's a process of accidentally stumbling on things that work better than the last thing. It's altogether possible that this particular quirk of male wiring occurred as a mutation millions upon millions of years ago and spread through the population simply because the males who had it were competitive with other males and those who didn't were not. If the very first male animal whose neurons were wired this way was wildly more successful than all the others, it's conceivable that an entire model of social organization, the tournament system, would have grown out of that one mutation. This is low-level wetware, and regardless of how many layers of new adaptations we've built on top of it, it remains a fundamental difference in the brains and sexualities of men and women, one that cannot help but have an impact on their motivations and behaviors. The only real question is what motivations does it produce, and what behaviors result from them. The more I examine it in the context of the increasingly gender-symmetrical data on sexual aggression in men and women, and the different styles and outcomes of same-sex competition in women, the more I'm inclined to believe that this particular quirk is not about male sexual aggression against women, but about motivating men to compete with other men in dominance hierarchies. Well, I suppose that is a genuine question. Another question might be this. If men have an innate drive to seize power, 
powerless weapons men access to sexual options, while women use their sexuality to gain access to power. Which sex is the truly power hungry one? Anyhow, that's all I have to say about that. Uh, please remember that this is mostly conjecture and uh, just something that I, it's, it's been driving me crazy for about a month and uh, given the data. And uh, I would really welcome uh, anybody's input in the comments, uh, any kind of uh, criticisms or, or input you have. So that's it for me for today. And uh, hopefully you won't have to wait quite so long for my next video. Bye. Not too long ago, uh, I had it out with a feminist who had come into a male safe space uh, from a feminist blog, uh, just to scoff at the idea of male disposability. Um, she she went. Rosebud.